the south coast. It's a rugged place. Steep cliffs, solid rock. A hard spot to start up a community. But there used to be dozens here. Wherever people found a crack in the rocks, that's where they settled. Many of those towns are just memories now. They were resettled back in the 60s. But others remain, and there's one here, on Long Island, hidden behind these cliffs. At first, you've got a job finding it. You strain your eyes, looking along the shore. Finally, as evening closes in, you spot the flashing beacon that marks the harbor entrance. You round the headland, and they come into view, the lights of Galtus. No one seems to know where the name came from. Some say it could be named after a French family that settled here in the 1700s. Others say it means the place of the gulls. It's morning, the first week in December. So far, the snow's held off, and the place is alive. It's not easy to build a house here. So much rock and hardly a piece of flat ground. But new houses are going up. And I mean up. Not much firewood here either. Most people cut their wood off the island and bring it home by boat. How did Galtus escape the resettlement program? It had so much going against it. Less than 600 people on an island with no ferry boat, no roads to speak of, no water and sewer, and no hospital. The answer is simple. Galtus had a fish plant, built by the Lake Group back in the early 50s supplied by a fleet of side trawlers. That's why Galtus escaped. And that's why people who were resettled from other places came here to work in the plant. And that's where more than 200 of them do work, or did, until this past August. The Lake Group closed the plant. Financial trouble, they said. People in Galtas weren't sure what that meant. Something about high interest rates and bad markets. The company also told them the plant was old and needed repairs. The side trawlers were also a problem. They're old too. They're hard to operate in rough weather. They can't carry enough fuel to go after the northern cod like the big stern trawlers do. And besides, they're not built for ice. When the fleet was tied up and the workers laid off, most everyone was caught by surprise. Things had seemed so secure. What happens when the one thing that keeps an isolated community like this going suddenly stops? We went to Galtus to find out. Hubert Engram was one of those laid off. He started work at the Galtus fish plant 30 years ago, when he left his home in Stone Valley to become the plant's carpenter. I was told that there was going to be a plant started in Galtus, and the man that told me was the man was involved into it. And he told me if I plan on looking for a job, it'd be priority for a shift and come to Galtus. I know Galtus is a poor place for sick people. I mean, you, you know, you've got no roads and you've got no transportation to get to it, but the people who got away this last 30 years, 
I think myself for guys that private, they get by a little longer. But I'd rather sooner stay in Gaulish and work than I think about shipping. Because the point I looked at is shipping from Gaulish and to get back what I've got at the time I've been here, I think that I'm going to have to owe somebody else money to get it. I don't mind leaving Gaulish. If somebody's prepared to give me a home, which I don't think is going to happen, and a job, because a lot of those people that lived out of those places, as I knew about, lots of them today is pretty unhappy. So I don't want to be one of them. I think if they could come up with some money and put the repairs to the plant, it's only wood and concrete. And there, I mean, uh, that's what I was put in the first place, and uh, it might uh, need a a better upgrading inside. I mean, say, you know, it wants to be changed and done, but uh, I don't think it's that hard for to get this plant back in in situation again if uh, people, if the money could come up. Hubert isn't happy about being laid off, and he doesn't like the way it was done. When I went back from my job in the evening, that uh, my two weeks' notice was put a place on my toolbox in the carpet shop, and I picked it up and read it. And he told me they was going to lay me off the last of October and hopes to reward me in a short period of time. But they haven't come up yet. So they didn't tell you personally they left a note in your toolbox? <coughs> no, sir, they didn't come to me face to face and tell me that I was going to be laid off. How'd you feel about that? Not too good. As far as I'm concerned, I was always a worker and I, you know, I looked forward every day getting up in the morning and go to work. But now I don't know where I stand. Many people think the Galtus plant has been locked up since August, but it hasn't. A few workers have been kept on to handle and store fish caught by the few inshore fishermen who live here. A handful of small inshore boats work out of Galtus, and there's one longliner. It's early morning. We're aboard that one longliner, the Charlie and Wade, owned by Bill Herrett heading out of Galtus for the three-hour steam to Pass Island at the mouth of Hermitage Bay. It's still dark, but Bill and his crew start setting their lines. A couple of hours later, just as the sun's coming up, they start hauling them in. First, it doesn't look too good. The hooks are coming back empty. More squid has to be cut. The hooks baited again, and the lines reset. It's hard work, made that much harder when you're not getting any fish. Today could be another bad day. Bill's had a lot of those this fall. There's no fish, and the weather has been bad. You get it one day a week, two days a week. Some weeks we haven't got it at all. And then when you get set, you get a thousand pound of fish, 1,500 pound, 1,200 pound, down to the lowest 300 pound, of seven and eight tubs a year. So, you know, it's pretty tough. The other falls, is you had bad weather, you get it one day a week, you know, you get two or three thousand pounds. Because uh, it seemed like the fish used to gather, you know, back on the ground when you was ashore, right? Nobody catching it. But not this far. If you were ashore for a month, I think it'd be the same thing. But today, we're lucky. The gulls are a good sign. There's cod. Hey, big ones.
redfish. The odd halibut. The south coast is ice free in the winter, so Bill fishes year round. Well, we find it better now wintertime because, uh, you know, there's more fish wintertime than there is summertime. You know, most everybody says uh, when it gets cold and frosty that the fish, you know, comes in. I don't know. Must be the bait, I guess, brings it in. Uh, we don't get any capon or anything summertime now, so there's nothing to bring in the fish, eh? So I guess the herring must bring it in wintertime. Bill's son-in-law, Gerald Lee, hauls in the fish. I had to fight through a case of laryngitis to have a few words with him. Bravo! Bravo! Is that the last, that the last of your lines? Yeah, that's it. In this lot. How much do you think you hauled in so far? 52 lines. How much fish? Oh, well, so we got 30 odd under. How much is that worth altogether, would you say? Pardon? I said, how much is that worth altogether, would you say? Any idea? Five, six hundred. Good day. Is that a good day? Yeah, pretty good. Bill's son, Donnie, guts the fish. He usually works in the fish plant. But since the layoff, he's been going out with his father the odd time to help with the fishing. Now I'll cut him in the middle of his dinner or breakfast, whatever. Uh, do you usually catch him this size? Yeah, usually. What, what, what else are you catching? No, that's, it's a redfish there. That's a redfish, right. What do you get for that? Uh, I'm not sure now. I believe it's, uh... Yeah, what's the price of redfish? 11.5, I think. 11.5. What else do you get in here? Uh, pollock. Uh, headache. And uh, we got an olive butt. One olive butt, you saw that. Of course, cod you get the best price for, isn't it? Right. Well, well you get the best price for olive butt, but, uh, they're not too plain, though. Is this a good day now? Uh, yeah, really. Yeah, really. It is a good right, day. It is good day yes. how, how much bigger is this normal from what you normally get? Well, yesterday we only had 15, 1,500, right? Today we got about 3,000, so. It's still coming in. It's still coming in, right? Let's okay, let you get back to work. Okay. It turned out even better than the boys guessed. We ended up with nearly 5,000 pounds of fish. That's more than $700 worth. It's the best day's fishing that Charlie and Wade has had this fall. Bill was pleased with the catch, but steaming for home, Galtus was on his mind. Only one thing I could say for Galtus is pack up your bag and get out. That's all I could say. I don't know any other, any other solution. I don't know what they're going to do there. They got no draggers. All the draggers are just about wore out. And the side dra draggers, they're not much good now anyway. And the plant is old. So I, I, don't, I don't know what they're going to do there. Because if they loan some money now, this year, well, I think it's going to be the same thing in, in, you know, in the next three or four years. It's going to be the same thing over again. Back in Galtus, a longliner was already being unloaded. But that's not fish they're unloading, it's gravel. Like firewood, gravel's scarce around here. This load had to be brought over from Hermitage. It's being used to patch up the only road in Galtus. No worries about blocking traffic here, Aside from the one the boys are using, there are only five other trucks in Galtus and not a single car. The boys doing the road work are all fish plant workers. They were laid off in August. And the town councils hired them for a make work project. Larry Snook is one of them. Lunchtime in the Snook household. 
Larry and his wife Nadine have five children. Two of them are in school. A young family, a large family, and a happy one. They got a big stake in this tiny, isolated town. Formerly, I'm from Harbor Britain, and I came in there and we, uh, got married and uh, settled down and bought our house and that. It was a bit tough on the first for me just to uh, not being able to jump into a car and go on. But uh, after you get used to it, after a few years or whatever, uh, but, uh, the adjustment comes in. It fits into the place. You get used to having to get a boat. And after a while, you don't even think about a car. Oh, I, I, I prefer a, a smaller place. I, I, I really love living here in Galtas. I really do. I think it's a great place to uh, raise a family. I love it because the people are so close. You know, you have so many friends. And, you know, it'd be, it'd be bad to, to have to, uh, everybody have to split up and, uh, you know, but the place is so small, and you know, so many people. You know everybody, yeah. You don't find it uh, inconvenient that you can't hop in your car and go to a shopping mall or anything? No, like because we were never used to it. We haven't got much traffic here in Galls, but believe me, it's enough in time. We've got enough to get around. A little walk never hurt anyone. You can hear tell all the exercises those day and age. Well, that's what we're getting in Galls, exercise by walking. But then, then again, I mean, uh, I figure my kids are better off here and what it would be living in a bigger town because the drug problem today and everything seems to be so great. In Gaulis is a small place and you don't hear much about those things. Everything's going along so well. The community's quite happy. Everybody had a job. And suddenly, without any warning and very little information for you people, it was all gone. That's right, Jim. So if, even if it starts up again, will you be able to just go back and forget about it all? Well, sure. Oh, yes. That's no problem. We got to. What other choice do we have? Like you say, we got our homes there. We got our families there. And we got everything here, right? So we're going to have no other choice. But like, like I said before, the only way that people are going to be sure of what they're doing, if we see, if the government comes up with the money for the late group, that the money is put in the building, the building needs to be repaired. And that's what we need. It's not the people's fault, I mean, that uh, this problem has come up. And I don't know whose problem, whose fault it is. I'm not saying it's anybody's, but I know there's a problem. I mean, we don't need, uh, like I said, we don't need nothing, only work. And we're willing to work here. Right? We just need the government to come in and or, or somebody to do something to help the people get work done. That's all. Let's get this problem straightened up. Would it be hard for these people to move? No. Sir, I wouldn't even mind. I wouldn't even. Go ahead. I wouldn't even, I wouldn't even mind. A, I don't even, barely even mind to think about something like that. But moving, of course, it would be hard for everybody to move. Somebody who's been uh, here for years, and even myself, I've only been here for six years. But I got my own home here. I got my family and everything else. We're quite, we're settled away quite easy. I think it's a free country. I mean, a man should have that freedom. I mean, I choose to live here, have my own here, and everything else. And then somebody comes in and say, "Now we got an industry. We're going to close it down. You got to get out, pack up, and go. Start all over again. Me with six hands there. It's impossible." I wouldn't know where to turn to, or who to turn to. No such thing. I want to stay here. I'm sitting away quite happy here. From the short time we've been here, it seems that people are bearing up pretty well. They're pretty happy. They have to, you know. They, they have to try and, uh, try and uh, live day by day and uh, hope for the best. Because, I mean, if the man got to gotta get, uh, get down and worry about things what it's going to be, then, I mean, he's going to have his whole family miserable which is not right, the right thing to do, you know. He's got to keep up for his family. You know, he has to uh, try to do, and do his everyday thing until everything works out, hopefully for the best. Would you ever want to leave her? No, never. I never want to leave her. We're always used to bringing home a couple hundred dollars, a couple hundred dollars a month, to uh, a couple hundred dollars every two weeks to my wife. Then you comes down, you got to go on unemployment for $120 a week. I mean, you're used to that extra $80. So where are you going to get that from in order to pay your other bills? For, you know, say we needed that much money to get along, right? So we're, you know, it's really been tough because, I mean, you got to scrape along. I mean, you can't buy the things you want to buy, and you can't do the things that you want to do. A little earlier, I mentioned that when the lakes closed the plant, almost everyone in Galtus was caught by surprise. Here's part of the reason. People here thought the future was secure. They thought they had that in writing, from the president of the Lake Group, Spencer Lake. A lot of the people I talked to showed me dog-eared copies of this letter Spencer Lake sent out to the plant workers in August of 1980. The Fishermen's Union was in town, trying to sign up the plant workers. A few days before the vote, 
Lake sent out the letter. I'll read part of what it said. To my friends in Galtus, I understand you are having a vote to decide whether or not you want a union in Galtus. I told you a year or two ago that although we were expanding by buying more plants, that we would always look after and operate the Galtus plant. And we have plans in hand for plant improvement and trawler replacements in Galtus. This we intend to do because you have always been loyal and dependable good people. What I am really trying to say is that a vote against the Union is a vote for the future fishery and prosperity of Galtus. The workers voted against joining the Union. Almost exactly one year later, Lakes closed the Galtus plant. The Lake Group is the biggest employer in Galtus. People here are loyal to the company. They're reluctant to talk about the letter. Everett Sims of the Rural Development Association spoke for them. Well, I mean, uh, Spencer Lake, uh, Mr. Lake there, uh, he put the plant in Galtus, and, uh, and over the years, uh, people have built up a lot of respect for Mr. Lake, and they, they felt, and they still feel, that he's a very sincere person. But, uh, and that people feel that they have been instrumental in, uh, in putting the plant there and, and the company, building the company. And they have done everything in their power, believe me. They've been over backwards for the Lake Group. And there they are, uh, even they've, they've stayed away from unions, for instance, you know, on, on uh, Mr. Lake's uh, request. They've done everything. And now there they are, they're, they're, they're being betrayed. We want our committee, committee to use the media, media to show the Lake Group and both levels of government that we are concerned and will fight to ensure our livelihood. Thank you. public meeting in the Galtus School. Almost every man and woman in the town is there. A good place to find out how people feel about Galtus and about the Lake Group. And if the government decide to put the 15 million dollars back into the company, we think that they should uh, send the lakes back to uh, business school first and show them how to operate a company. <laughs> For one thing, I think if the lake groups of companies didn't think enough about their trawler men to at least give them the pay that they deserve in year-round basis of what they had to go through year-round on the ICs, I think they're not worth to, I don't know what you can put them down to. I think you will all agree with me that the homes in Galtus are really good homes, both inside and out and moving cannot even be considered. Of a, union by the workers. a delegation has just returned from St. John's, the, where they met with the president of the Lake Group, Timothy Eburn. Galtus Mayor Wayne Kendall says he hasn't got much to report, and what he has isn't good. And believe you me, that after listening to Mr. Eburn, that the Lake Group of Companies is in very bad financial situation. We pose a number of questions to Mr. Eburn, it was pointed out to him also that there is a feeling in Goddess that we have been led down the garden path by the company. And to emphasize the point that I was trying to make that I uh, read from a letter that was sent to the workers in Goddess, whereby the Spencer Lake reported or said to the people in Goddess that a vote against a union is a vote for the future and prosperity of Goddess. And he said, Goddess, has a very special place in the heart of Spencer Lake. What special place Galtus has in the heart of Spencer Lake, only time would tell, I guess. Just before we left Galtus, the plant went back into production. It was only for one day. When enough inshore fish has been stored in the plant to make a day's work, the workers are called in. They only earn about $50 each, but everyone looks forward to it. Bill Herrett's son, Donnie, handling the fish he helped catch a couple of days ago. Larry Snook, taking a break from patching up the road. 
It's good to see them and everyone else on the cutting line, to see the plant going full tilt. The last four months have changed Galtus. The future doesn't seem quite so certain anymore. Government money may help the plant, but for how long? Is the building too old? Are the trawlers on their last legs? What will be the relationship between the town and the lake group? People in Galtus have learned a lot during the past four months. They've learned that no community is immune from hard times, even after 30 years of steady work and prosperity. And they've also learned that they've got something good going here, something that's worth fighting for.